Hi, welcome to Fashion Talks for Industry, a special series of Fashion Talks. I'm your host, Donna Bishop. In these episodes, I will be speaking with experts across all manner of professions who will offer their insights, tools, strategies that you can use in your business, whether you are an entrepreneur or an executive, a founder or a freelancer, whether you are just starting your career or have years of experience under your belt. Lara Koretsky, I am so happy to have you on Fashion Talks today. Welcome. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. So you are a leadership coach. That's right. Give us a little bit about what that means and how you came to this amazing profession before we get into kind of like the meat of some of the things you're seeing with clients and some tools and strategies that people can start using right away in their business. Okay. So what it means is I work with individuals and teams and I help them rediscover their professional purpose. I help them bolster their leadership skills that includes emotional intelligence, communication skills, relationship skills. And then I also help them achieve goals and get unstuck. A lot of people I work with feel stuck at some point and it's getting them unstuck. So when I say leadership, everyone's a leader to me. So whether you're working independently, a sole contributor, you're leading an aspect of your life, you're leading a project, you're leading an organization, or you're leading others. So everyone benefits from leadership coaching. And what is the relationship between your purpose and your values and your goals? Like, why is it important to explore those things? And what's the relationship between the two? Right. So if I'm going to get really technical, I can fall back on the work of Marty Seligman, who founded Positive Psychology. And in that tenet, they believe that there are five things that really lead to an engaged, joyful life, a life of well-being. And that includes finding meaning in your life, having positive emotions, being engaged in what you do. So that's that kind of flow moment where you don't even realize that three hours have gone by. It's when you have really strong relationships, professional relationships, personal relationships, and then a sense of accomplishment. So those five elements lead us to a life of well-being, and they're very connected. I love this because when I think sometimes, I know, you know, before we started talking about your work, I had assumptions about business coaches, that it was all about, you know, ROI and marketing and finances, and you're giving it so much more breadth than I had originally thought. I think that probably resonates with a lot of people who are listening. Yeah, it's really where it's meeting a client where they want support, where they are now. And yes, we can talk about ROI and financial resourcing and achievement. And yet, if you don't have the other components, you're going to live a pretty unfulfilled life, an unfulfilled professional life. And it can also lead to things like burnout. Well, and burnout is one of the things that we're that we're going to get to because we had talked about, you know, obviously you work with all kinds of leaders and all kinds of organizations who have their own challenges and specific things that they're working towards. But what are some of the things that you have seen kind of across the board that maybe people listening will be able to resonate with where you're like, I can't, you know, it, it amazes me that these are common challenges that I'm seeing all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. So a couple of things that I'm seeing that are relevant. One is burnout. And what's interesting is people think that burnout really came about after COVID. In 2019, the World Health Organization noted burnout as a worldwide epidemic. So this has been going on for a while. However, I think it has worsened or I'm not sure which It may be that people are talking about it more. So I am seeing more burnout. doesn't matter what gender, what industry, what profession. Really, it's sort of across the board. There's more prevalence of burnout and more talk about preventing it, which we can get into. Another thing that I see, and this is human nature, is getting caught in those negative emotions and that negative self-talk. So helping my clients reframe what's going on. I was looking up a study yesterday and it was at Cornell. 85% of the things we worry about don't actually happen. 
So can you imagine if you spent 85% of your psychic energy and physical energy on something else? So it's negating those, I call it the itty bitty shitty committee. Oh yeah, uh, they're the powerful, saboteurs. man. Oh yeah, and we all have it. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't mean you're bad for having these voices. It's recognizing when those voices are interfering with what we want to do. And I imagine for entrepreneurs that 85% of worry can really clutter and get in the way of, of goals and moving towards things that are real because your itty bitty shitty committee has you really preoccupied with things that aren't going to come to fruition is what I hear mm -hmm. you saying anyways. Yes. So I think as entrepreneurs, often because we're working as sole practitioners, sometimes we have more of a tendency to ruminate. We have less connection with others unless we really make sure that we're doing that. So that rumination cycle can get really, really large. So we're listening to that instead of recognizing it and moving forward. Well, and let's start with talking about burnout, because as you are just talking there, it makes me think, I imagine that there's lots of people who are dealing with personal burnout or mm -hmm. observing and wanting to support team members that are managing burnout. Yeah. I think of burnout as I'm in the fetal position and everything feels too daunting <laughs> to do anything with. Maybe that's an extreme example. How do we know if we're in burnout? Like sometimes, you know, especially as, as entrepreneurs in an industry that can move as quickly as fashion, we can be in something and not even realize we are experiencing it. So what are some of the key sort of signs and symptoms of burnout that we might recognize in ourselves and recognize or hope to recognize in a team member so we can support them? Yeah, thanks for that question. It's so important because often we don't recognize it. Yes, being in the fetal position and crying, that would be one sign. In addition to that, I would say there are probably three major components. The first is this feeling like you're on the hamster wheel and you're go, 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 and yet you're not actually feeling productive. So it's this constant feeling I'm churning my wheels and I'm not getting anything accomplished. The second is this feeling of cynicism or resentment. If you're working for an organization, it can sometimes show up as I'm really pissed off at the man, I'm really pissed off at my boss, I, I'm just cynical about everything. And the third thing are, are the physical symptoms. So that is a feeling of fatigue, exhaustion. We all know that we have some sort of visceral reaction to stress and anxiety. So it could be the pit of the stomach, it could be the throat, it could be constant headaches. So that would be the third major symptom. And as you're describing that, you know, I, I've read and watched enough Brene Brown to be dangerous. And <laughs> it like, it sounds like it would be easy to describe or, or to think of what you're describing as, well, that's just stress. Like, I'm just stressed. I'm just working hard and not understand the gravity of mm -hmm. what some of those symptoms are and the impact that they might be having on us as individuals. Right. So stress is a part of life. And there's actually research that shows that some stress is good. It's called eustress. That's the stress that's more cyclical and helps us perform. And we need some stress in our life to understand like the joyful moments and the negative moments. So stress is normal. What is abnormal is when it's ongoing. So imagine a gas tank and you never fill it. And the meter constantly goes down, 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 down the gas gauge. So if you are on that cycle where you never feel rested, where you always feel exhausted and cynical and resentful and unproductive, that's an indication that it's a prolonged period of time that could be burnout. And often, so what do we, so I've, so now I've acknowledged that I'm like, okay, I think burnout might be something that I am experiencing. Mm -hmm. What do I do next? Yeah, that's a great question. So people often turn to vices and I'm going to suggest, I, I'm not going to say you can't do certain things and you want to do everything in more moderation, recognizing what's going on. So recognition is the first part. If you realize that something is going on, I've had this prolonged feeling for a long time. I do want to stress at this point that a lot of people who are feeling burnout tend to be those 
type A's, high performers who have been achieving for so long and almost have that saboteur voice of a high achiever. So I am valued for my achievements versus I'm valued for who I am. So just a distinction, it's not bad if you have burnout. It's not an indication that you are a poor entrepreneur or a poor employee or you can't handle things. It's often those high achievers that, that gain it. So back to your question. What do we do if we think this is something that is, that is affecting us? So recognition is the first step. Definitely, you want to be able to recognize it. Two, reach out to someone. If you don't feel like you have someone that you can reach out to, uh, if you're working for an organization, you look at an EAP. If you're working solo, talking to your doctor is really important, talking to a friend, calling a helpline. And then really, we want to reset. So we need to recharge those batteries. We need to fill the gas tank. So what does that mean? It means taking a step back. So you've recognized and now you need to reset and rest. Often what happens is people don't realize it until it's quite late and then they're taking six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks off. What we want to do is understand the science of burnout early so that we can rest and recharge and then establish boundaries. And that would be my biggest thing is establishing boundaries for yourself and for others, communicating them and ensuring that you are standing by them. I want to get into boundaries, but before we do, when you say take a step back and recharge, like I can, I can hear a chorus of people going, I have no time to take like time off. Like I run a business, I've got this, like, Mm -hmm. does time off mean weeks or days, or can it be even just 15 minutes in your office with the door closed? Like, what does it look like? And I appreciate it's probably very individual, Mm -hmm. but what is kind of like a, how do we manage our own expectations of what time off might look like for us? Thanks. So absolutely. It could be the 15 minute rest. It could be the 30 second rest. So the idea is we're running a marathon here. We're not doing sprinting. And if you're constantly running, 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 and you're not recharging and you're not managing your levels, you can tell I am not a runner, then (laughs) we're going to be exhausted. We're going to burn out. So what you want to do is you want to intersperse in your day periods of rest and recovery. That could be 10 minutes of mindfulness. That could be 30 minutes of a walk around the block. It could be five minutes of thinking of a time that you belly laughed. Honestly, those positive emotions, you want to resurface those. So stepping away from the computer, stepping away from social media, the phone, and recharging yourself by simple things. One tip that I love to offer is something called a positive intelligence rep, a PQ rep, which can be done in as quickly as one minute. So we love often, one minute things. One minute. And, and it's a type of mindfulness. So often we're told to focus on our breathing. That is one methodology. Sometimes that stresses us out further. So what are some other things you can do? So what I like to do is something where I'm really paying attention to physical sensations. I take my forefinger and my thumb and I start to rub them up against each other. And I really focus on the ridges of my fingertips. I focus on the sensation of my skin. I'm concentrating on nothing but that feeling. I'm doing it with you. It's actually very calming. (laughs) For 30 seconds. Imagine I'm not talking, that you're focusing on that for 30 to 60 seconds. It will take you, as one of my clients said, from alpha to beta. And once you've removed that instant stress, that trigger, that amygdala hijack, it allows you to return and resume things. So that would be an example of a 60 second way of recharging. And I imagine it's important longer. I imagine, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, Mm -hmm. but I imagine it's important also to not 
put too much pressure on like, if it doesn't work the first time, that is not for me. Like that we're talking about nervous system regulation, right? Yeah. So these things can take practice. They take time just because, you know, you know, 30 seconds of focusing on your breathing didn't work for you the first time doesn't mean it won't work for you the second time. So really give yourself the grace to experiment and try many things. Exactly. I mean, the, every one of those mindfulness podcasts tells you, yeah, it's normal to like drift off and then you come back. Breathing didn't work for me. Maybe I'll try this sensation thing. That doesn't work for me. Maybe I'll pay exquisite attention to the sounds that I hear for 60 seconds, close sounds, far sounds. Take a sense, any sense, and pay attention to that. Now, you mentioned boundaries, which mm -hmm. I imagine are very important in terms of, oh, well, all sorts of things in our lives. But in terms of when we're talking about burnout and, and trying to bring ourselves to a place of going from alpha to beta, why are boundaries important? Where do you see them in the workplace where it is important to assert and maintain them? Yeah, I Boundaries are so important in our personal lives and our professional lives. As a person with a recovering pleaser saboteur, you know, I have to say yes to everything. I have learned how important it is to say no. So I will say every time you say yes to something, you are saying no to something else. So when we think about that, if I say yes to taking on another engagement, that's a no to spending time with my family or training for that marathon or whatever it is you want to be doing. Sometimes a yes is a, a hell yes, so you do it. Just realize that it's a no on the other side because if we continue to say yes and we don't establish boundaries, it will have an impact on our ability to achieve things. We're gonna end up disappointing someone, ourselves, a client, a family member. We can only do so much. We are human. Burnout happens when we believe that we are no longer human. Ooh, let that sit for a second. When we feel like we are beyond the toils and strains of what it means to be human. Yes. What if I am a leader, an entrepreneur, a founder, a CEO? How might I identify burnout in the people who I work I work with and what are some things leaders can do to try and foster some of these things and maybe support team members that are 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 experiencing burnout in their own lives yeah so i love this because this is getting into leading others or leading an organization so we hear a lot about psychological safety so basically, psychological safety means that we have created an environment where people feel like they can speak to us, where they feel safe. Now, does that mean unloading all their personal woes or you think, oh, God, I have to be a therapist to run this business. I didn't sign up for it. No. What it means is that your employees feel comfortable or your colleagues feel comfortable talking to you when something doesn't feel right. So that is important to do as an entrepreneur, as a leader, to set up that environment of psychological safety. And how we do that is really by communicating openly with our team members. Often I will work with teams to establish what I call a design alliance. Really, it's just a fancy way of, I'm gonna set up some norms for how we're going to show up together. How are we gonna communicate? What are we going to do when there's conflict? How do we make decisions? Uh, what happens if something's not going right in your life? How am I going to respond? How are you going to respond? So it's talking about those things early so that when it happens, and I'm not going to say if conflict happens, when it happens, you have this guidebook on how you're going to respond. And can an organization do that really at any phase? Like if there's someone listening who's like, oh my goodness, I've been in business for five years and we've never done anything like that. Is it is it too late? Or can you just sort of like stop the train where it is and say, you know what, team, here is something we're, we're bringing in. Yeah, absolutely. So I remember when I had kids, someone said to me, there's no perfect time to have kids. This is the opposite. Every time is a perfect time to have Design Alliance. So it could be when you add 
new team members. It could be when you establish a new team. It could be when you're in conflict. It could be with the team that's been going for 10 years and you want to refresh. There's no bad time. And what does that do for the health of the organization? Like when you have that, that you've designed that alliance, what are the benefits that you would, you would, you know, hope that the organization will experience as a result of doing that work? Yeah, well, I can tell you what I see when I work with my clients. One, there's a shared language. So we talk about the elephant in the room. I've actually worked with a team where we talked about, you know, what happens when there's something you don't want to discuss, you know, that elephant in the room. And about a week later, I got an email with a picture of an elephant stuffy. And they're like, look what we bought. And it's sitting in our boardroom so that any time one of us feels uncomfortable, we grab that elephant, we throw it on the table and say, elephant in the room. So there's a shared language, there's humor that comes along with it, and there's an understanding of how we show up and how we want to show up. And I, I'm just envisioning this elf stuffed elephant being thrown on the table and how that would disarm everyone because, you know, and I'm just reflecting on this for myself, those hard conversations, we build them up to be maybe our itty bitty shitty committee like kind of takes over and we imagine that they're going to be catastrophic when really the relief that comes from putting it out there and grabbing that elephant is far more, it's, it's less potent than we imagine it to be and far more relieving than we imagined it to be. Absolutely. So let's go back to that stat. 85% of the time we worry about things that never actually happen. And I would say anecdotally, in my experience, those difficult conversations, most of the time they don't end up being difficult or they're difficult initially and you get to a better place. I'm often brought in to do workshops on feedback and difficult conversations. And once we learn the tools for how to have those conversations, it makes it a lot easier in terms of other people understanding our intent. And are all those negative emotions, because I can hear, I'm just loving saying itty bitty shitty committee now over and over <laughs> again. Um, but I mean, fear is the bedrock of that, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> so yes, true. Yes. So as a leader, how do I move through the fear in order to, you know, bring these negative emotions down to support mm -hmm. myself and support my team? And I know that's a loaded question and you're like, you know, we're getting workshops. very existential right now. So. Yeah. <laughs> so how do I, I alleviate some of the fear? Okay. So sometimes the fear is okay, right? So my kids, they're both performers. They talk about how they're really nervous. And what we do is we reframe that nerve, like that nervousness as excitement and anticipation. It means you're preparing to do something amazing and incredible. So reframing helps a lot. That would be my first strategy. My second strategy is understanding that the fear is because you care about something deeply. So you mentioned the values word before. Values are what we must have in our life. It's not what we aspire to. They're not fancy words on the wall. It's what we need to have in order to feel fulfilled, in order to feel human, in order to flourish. So knowing that there is some fear in order to reach those values or to live those values, that's actually pretty important. So I would say those are two components. And the third component, often our fear manifests viscerally, as we were mentioned before. So without getting hugely into neuroscience, is that whole idea of the amygdala hijack, that fight, flight, or freeze. Something happens, our amygdala like hijacks, and we feel the sudden rush of, you know, our heart beating is too quickly. We can't breathe. What's going on? We want to bring the amygdala back in check. So that's where I go back to that 60 second PQ rep. Right now, I'm just going to breathe. Right now, I'm going to rub my fingers together or listen to all the sounds so that you're bringing your nervous system into check. And then you're starting to think with that part of your brain that really problem solves, that part of your brain that consciously knows that you are a kick-ass leader and you can do this. What would you say to someone who has, you know, they come in and they hear this and they say, Laura, like, 
I get it, but I don't have time. I don't have time. Oh, you're laughing. Is this something you've heard before? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what do you say to someone? Because I, I like we're all busy, right? And especially as leaders with organizations, there's always something. There's mm -hmm. always something. How do you encourage someone to take the leap of faith that prioritizing the 30 seconds of mindfulness, mm -hmm. that prioritizing these things that we've just discussed are actually what the business needs? Yeah. Yeah. So first off, I'd ask, don't have time for what? How much time do you spend like looking at social media or I don't know, standing in front of the fridge, whatever it is, like something. So yes, I think everyone can find 60 seconds in their day. The second component is I'd say, if you don't spend the time now, then you're going to spend the time later. And that's why when working with teams, hey, let's do this design alliance up front because it will save you a hell of a lot of time later. Let's do this leadership work on yourself up front because then you'll become self-sufficient and it will save you a lot of time later. Just before we wrap up, because I, 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 I know I am furiously taking notes of just some things we've talked about that I needed to be reminded of myself. What are some of the, you know, kind of, I don't want to call them success stories because we all are in a in a constant you know ebb and flow of challenge and success and whatnot but do you have any anecdotes of where you've seen an organization really thrive as a result of maybe bringing some of these strategies that you've that you've shared into the fold of their fabric yeah i would say i've seen a lot of success out there i think you know that time or that commitment piece often scares people. So think about this. When you work with a coach, you get an hour or 45 minutes, 30 minutes dedicated to you. Unless you're working with a therapist, that rarely happens. So someone who is completely centered on you or your team, asking you these questions, probing questions that are causing you to think in a different way. So I can think of one of my clients that I initially worked with her and then I worked with her team and she hadn't spent any of that time really focusing on her leadership, focusing on some of the saboteur voices that she had heard or really focusing on how she shows up as a leader every day. After we worked together, she rediscovered the joy in her work. She reconnected with clients. She reconnected with her team and understood that she wasn't communicating effectively. She then brought that to the team, and I've been fortunate to work with this team now several, several times, whether it's designing that alliance or working on specific skills, finding that purpose, why they show up every day in that specific organization. So I think I would conclude by saying we spend so much of our time doing the busy work, feeling that exhaustive sheet of to-dos. I mean, I'm one of those people with little check boxes. I even put things that I've already done on my list so I can feel like I've accomplished things. I don't know what you're talking about. I've never no, done that. No, no one ever does that. If we were to spend a little bit of time focusing on our to-be list, I guarantee you it's a game changer. So every day, as corny as it sounds, I wake up, I see my to-do list, I create my big to-do list, and then I grab a sticky note and I write three to be's. That's all, three. Today I want to be engaging. Today I want to be engaged. And today I want to be joyful. And I put that sticky note onto my laptop or on my desk or in my bag so that it's a reminder. Am I showing up joyful today? Am I showing up present and engaged? And that one tip that I was told about five years ago has revolutionized how I show up. And I hope it helps others too. That's so powerful, Lars. Thank you so much for being here today and sharing your expertise and your insights. You put so much great content for free on LinkedIn. We'll link that below. If people are interested in learning more about you or reaching out, where are the best places for them to find you? Absolutely. LinkedIn. That's one. Two, go to my website, lauracoretsky.com. I'm sure you'll have that in the notes. Absolutely. And we'll link it below. Yep. Or, or Google search me. I'm happy to uh, connect with anyone who's interested in learning more about leadership and themselves and their teams. 
Laura, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to uh, leave you and make a to-be list. Oh, sounds great. Thank you, Donna. It was a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for being here today. Fashion Talks is written, produced, and hosted by me, Donna Bishop. And there is a link below in the show notes if you'd like to get in touch. Thank you to CAFA, the Canadian Arts and Fashion Awards, Jason Perrier, technical producer, and to Nick Crane for the amazing artwork. Hope you'll join me here again soon.